Thank you, Jesus. Carol and I are going to just share a briefer word than normal. And uh, today is our last acts. Well, what would you call it? Our last acts uh, preach. <laughs> it's our last act of acts. And uh, have you enjoyed the act series? You know, when we started out, I remember thinking to myself, if you were someone who had never read the Bible before and you were stuck on some little island somewhere and all you had was the book of Acts and you read the book of Acts and then you suddenly got rescued and you ended up landing in a nation where there were churches and you ran to find a church because you'd read Acts and you wanted to see how this was acting out in the church. How many of you think there would be a little bit of a discrepancy? So our heart in looking at the book of Acts is we don't want to just look at it and say, that was amazing what you did back then. Jesus, that was great. Thank you for the miracles. We want to say, Lord Jesus, help us to become the church you're coming back for. We want to be doing these things. The church he's coming back for has every member ministering, every member moving in miracles, every member seeing these things. And that means every time we look at the, in our connect groups and the last one we're doing this week, we're looking at it and we're saying, Lord Jesus, the church you're coming back for looks more glorious than that. How many of you believe that? The church he's coming back for looks more glorious than the book in Acts. When I read that book of Acts, I'm saying that's just a taste of what he's coming back for. So Lord, I pray that as we wrap up this series today, we, we don't want to just have our mindsets changed. We want more power. We want more presence. We want to experience, my Lord, more of an uh, increase of anointing and revival in our midst. Every person sitting here, every person watching online, you have placed them as salt and light in different places of society. You've placed them in different families, different places of study, different places of work, different friendship circles, and you've placed them there as salt and light. And I'm praying that today you would remove every veil, remove every obstacle that would hinder us from being salt and light in the places you put us. We want to not just be the church on Sunday, but the church leaves the building after this and the church goes out as salt and light into this world so that it may be changed. And we ask for your grace and your power and your revelation to enable us to do that. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now those of you who read... Uh, you would have noticed we had a number of chapters in Acts, and you, if we just took the time to read it, our time would be up. So I'm going to assume that you have read from chapter 25 through 28, and I'm going to catch up a little bit. Um, Carol did an amazing job last week talking about how so many Jews had gone saved, they'd become Christians, but they were still holding on to that legalistic religious mindset that had lost sight of what Jesus paid the price for on the cross. Jesus paid a very high price on the cross for us to be set free from the law to be saved by grace. Amen? It is by faith you are saved through grace. Grace you are saved through faith. How does it go again? Either way, grace and faith, not by keeping rules and regulations. And these Jews had been giving everyone a hard time, and Paul gets to Jerusalem, and they eventually grab him, and they're giving him a hard time. They bring him before the Sanhedrin, and there is a dispute that arises, and the dispute gets so violent that the commander in charge has to pull Paul out and put him in the Roman barracks to protect him. And he's got Paul in the Roman barracks, and he's like, what's going on here? Why are these guys so mad at you? And uh, while Paul is in there under his protection, they discover that there is a whole group of these religious, fervent, law-holding Jews who want to kill Paul, and so much so that they've said, we will not eat until Paul is dead. That's quite a commitment. Anyway, you know, if you read the end of the book, there were a lot of Jews who basically just withered away, lost a lot of weight. I'm pretty sure their wives told them to eat after a while. So they say, we, we're not going to eat till we've killed Paul. So eventually they decide, well, we've got to, you know, get Paul out of here. And while Paul is there in the barracks, an angel appears to him. What does this angel say to him? I'm sure the angel said, hey, Paul, how are you doing? You know, all the normal greetings. But the main message was, take courage. As you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you will testify for me in Rome. So Paul knew that nothing was going to happen to him here. 
He doesn't have to fear because he's roaming off to Rome. Thank you. Inshallah. So the commander sends Paul to the governor of the time, whose name was Felix, sends him off to Felix. Now, Felix was hoping that Paul would bribe him. So he holds these little court sessions. He's got Jews coming in and Jews going out, and, and, and he's keeping Paul coming and going. But for two years, he's in prison with Felix, two whole years. You know, when you just read that one sentence, you think he went to Felix, then there was Festus, then off he went to... No, for two years, he's in prison there. All the time being encouraged that God's saying, you're still accomplishing my purposes. Eventually, Felix gets removed, and uh, he's replaced by Festus. And Festus starts to look at, why is this guy here? Calls him in, uh, has a hearing. Festus goes, you've done nothing wrong. Festus eventually, um, with the Jews all crying out, this guy deserves to die. He says, Paul, are you prepared to go to you know, Jerusalem to hear and fight against these things? And Paul says, I appeal to Caesar. In other words, in the Roman uh, law, as a Roman citizen who appealed to Caesar, they had no choice but to send him off to Rome. So he gets sent off to Rome. We just caught up three chapters in what? Four minutes and 32 seconds, eh? How was that? So he's off, and now he's on a ship, and he, they're on their way. He gets taken with a bunch of prisoners. There's about uh, 270 in total on the ship with the sailors, the prisoners. There's a centurion, and the centurion's name is uh, Julius. It wasn't Julius Caesar at the time. And he was Julius, but he actually really got to like Paul. Who wouldn't like Paul, really, unless you were a legalistic Jew? And Paul gets so much favor from Julius that when they land at Sidon, he lets Paul go off and visit with his friends. Can you see how much trust has developed here already? But then there's this huge storm that starts to develop. And while, they, while they're moving along, progress is slow. And I want us to start reading in chapter 27 and verse 9. So if we could go there, please. Thank you very much. Much time had been lost because of the storm, and sailing had already become dangerous, because by now it was after the fast. And we're not talking about the Jewish fast, where they were fasting about killing Paul. I hope they were still fasting. I don't know. So Paul warned them, Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous, and bring great loss to ship and cargo, to our lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, the storm continued raging. We finally gave up all hope of being saved. After the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, I told you so. Basically, that's in the original. You should have taken my advice. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage. Because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God, whose I am and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. Are you catching this? So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. In an attempt to escape from the ship, now, understand that. You all catch where we're at right now. But after all that, there are two attempts where death could have come that God intervenes through Paul. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down, uh, lifeboat down, pretending they were going to lower some anchors. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. Isn't that interesting? In other words, unless we all stay together. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it fall away. The second thing that happened, thank you, the soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away. It's very hard to swim away when you're dead. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. Why did the prisoners survive? Because of Paul. 
He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on pieces of the ship. And in this way, everyone reached land in safety. Everyone say, hallelujah. Isn't that quite a story? I mean, we, we read that in five minutes, but man, that is quite a story. Paul's been through some stuff. But I want us to see some things in this whole story today that applies to each and every one of us. How many of you have been in some storms? Okay, so those three of you, that's, today's for you. Those of you who've never had a storm, I promise you will. But you know, when you talk about what is God's purpose for my life, a lot of Christians who've been around the so-called prosperity message is that God's purpose for my life is to make me healthy and wealthy and comfortable, give me the best job I could ever wish for, that I'll never have problems, that you know I'm just going to be so wonderfully blessed all my life. Do you know what it means to be salt and light? Salt has to go places where there's no salt. You can't blame meat for going rotten without salt. You've got to blame the salt for not being there to preserve it. Some of you may have asked the question, God, why am I in this place? Why am I in this job? Why am I in this circle? Why, why am I surrounded by so much ungodliness? Because you're salt. Some of you are feeling assaulted because you're salt. How much was Paul assaulted? Paul, Paul was a great salt man and he got assaulted quite a bit for it. I want to say to you, this is not your home. This is not your final destination. And sometimes being salt means that you're going to go places where there's rotting meat. And don't look at it and go, God, I'm praying you give me out. This is not my best job. I hate this place. Please get me out of here. Sometimes we have to go, God, you put me here for a reason. Show me how to be salt and light here. And so I want to look at two things quickly and then hand over to Carol to wrap up. We can bring that next slide up. But there's something that Paul carried. He carried the presence of God. And we see something in the presence that he carried is that not only does he have peace in the storm, but he releases that peace to others. Amen. Paul knew he was safe in God. He knew that he was going to Rome. He knew nothing was going to happen. But one of the ways we salt and light in our communities is that we release the redemptive purposes of God in that environment. When you're in a place where there are storms, how does the world react? They get stressed out, fearful, anxious. They start using colorful words. You as a Christian sometimes feel exactly the same, don't you? I want to encourage you today to be like Paul and say, hang on. God's given me a promise. His presence is with me. Salt has to act different to meet. Salt must be different to the rotten meat. If the rotten meat is anxious and fearful, and all of this is good, it's all going to hurt the country, it's here to become just a, all of the stuff you're hearing about the country, the salt is here to say no. No, God's presence is on us. His church is strong in this nation, and He will preserve us. We meant to be salt at sea. We meant to be salt in the storms. We meant to be salt in the midst of shipwrecks. Wherever you go in, and no matter how horrible it looks and how terrible it feels and how everyone else is reacting, don't just say, Well, I'm at peace. I'm sorry about them. What did Paul do? He took them aside and he, it says he encouraged them. That means he gave them courage. You need to ask God to give you opportunities in the places you are sown as salt. To say, God, what can I say at the right moments to encourage those around me? When they come with anxiety, when they come with lies, when they come with the words of the enemy, give me the words of heaven so that I can bring peace in the midst of anxiety, so I can bring truth. Truth is light. Salt and light. Salt preserves. This country is protected because the salt is here preserving it. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how does that happen? We stop being salt. We start talking and thinking the same as the rotten meat. Don't lose your saltiness. And the second thing that we see is protection. Because God is with you, everyone with you benefits. Notice, God could have just saved Paul, not so. God didn't have to save the rest. 
But because of Paul's redeeming presence in that place, God's protection on Paul went for all of them. There was only one condition. You all need to stick together with Paul. How many of you know that your company might be going under and you might be the redeeming factor to say, no, it's not because I'm here. Your family might be going through tough stuff and you say, no, I'm the redeeming factor. I am here. Therefore, my family is protected. I don't know what your workplace is like. I don't know what your study place is like, your family is like, your social environment is like. But I want to encourage you right now to just ask God to show you, Lord, how, because of my presence there, is your presence in and through me able to be salt to preserve what's going on there, to bring truth, to bring light, to silence the darkness, to encourage and bring hope. If you have been those who have gone, yeah, I know the country's going through, beep, you know, so just everything so terrible, so, then you're not being salt, you've lost your saltiness. Then you're not bringing light, you speak in the words of darkness. Repent means change the way you think. Change the way you think so we can be salt and light wherever God has put you. Amen. I'm going to hand over to Pastor Darling to wrap this up. Awesome. Thank you, Pastor Handsome. I just want to just want to warn you. I thought it'd be really cool sitting on that chair on the stage. It's just it's just darn awkward. But okay, he's gonna be awkward. He's gonna be awkward. <laughs> because then I couldn't frown at my husband while he's preaching, you know, because you could all see. So I just but he it was it was so great there were no frowns there. But the story continues and it says once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood, and as he put it on the fire, a viper, driven out by the heat, fastened itself on his hand. When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, this man must be a murderer, for though he escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. But Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead. But after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their mind and said he was a God. Guys, how do you feel? I mean, when I don't, I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're an apostle. I don't care if you are the greatest healer in the world. When a snake bites you on the hand, it's painful. When a snake bites you on the hand, thoughts go through your mind. And yet Paul at that moment just shook it off. And it doesn't even say he prayed for his hand. It doesn't even say he took any notice of what happened. Happened. He just carried on doing what he was doing. I mean, that's, that's pretty freaky. Do you notice that when he was going through all that shipwreck and the, the, the storm was happening and everything was going on, it's like he absolutely was certain that he was going to get to Rome. Can you notice that every time anything happens, he is absolutely certain that he's going to get to Rome? You see, there was something that was happening in Paul that I believe God wants to put in our hearts. It's that if God has said it, it will happen. If God has purposed something for my life, I don't care. Let snakes come. Let storms come. Let shipwrecks come. God is getting me there. And you see, one of the problems that happens is when these things come, the snake bites, the storm happens. Instead of keeping our eyes on the destination, we turn to the storm and we're like, oh my word, how am I going to make it? We turn to the snake, oh my word, we've got to deal with this. It's got so bad, we've got to, we've got to fix this. And what ends up happening is we turn our eyes off the purposes of God. It is a biblical pattern from start to finish that when God has said something, he will do it. Do you, do you remember that really wild and crazy story where Abraham was asked by God to sacrifice his son Isaac? Do you remember that story? And 
I've read it every time, and it, it says there at the end, now I know that you are faithful to me. God says at the end of it, now I know. Like he was looking something for something in Abraham's heart. And often people s- talk about how Abraham being willing to give up the dream means that God could trust him. I don't even believe that for a second. And one day maybe we'll expound that, that story. But actually what God was looking for was, was Abraham willing to right from the beginning know that even if I sacrifice my son, God will raise him from the dead. Because God has said that this boy will rule Israel. And therefore, I know, I know that this will happen. Come sacrifice, come pain. I can even put him on a, a fire. God will resurrect him. And it was that faith, it was that absolute assurance that no matter what happens, God's going to be true to his word. That is the very thing that God looks into our hearts and said, faith. That's what faith looks like. Faith is not this thing we work up. Faith is, I trust God to be true to his word. I don't have to understand. I don't have to know why. I don't have to even be able to work things out. All I have to know is that I must keep facing the direction God has given me and keep walking. Keep going. Keep going. Because God is that faithful. Distractions and derailments. I was going to just say distractions, but then I realized, look, a snake bite's a little bit more than a distraction. A sh- a s- Shipwreck is a little bit more than a distraction. So I added derailments. Distractions and derailments fade away as we pursue God's purposes. Do you see how those things became non-things? As Paul just kept his eyes steadily on what God had said to him. You know, there's one other distraction that came Paul's way that, I don't know if you notice it, but when the snake bite came to nothing, all the people wanted to worship him as God. You know, another derailment that we have to purposefully push away and keep our eyes on the purpose is when things go really well. And everyone loves us. And everyone wants a part of us. And then we have to say, but you know what? Despite the fact that I'm getting all this adulation and all these fantastic things, this is what God said. I will not be distracted by that. I will keep going to the things God has said. So... Vanquished vessels, because shipwreck starts with an S and I needed to start with a V, but basically that's a shipwreck. Vanquished vessels, vipers and veneration. These are things that, that will come our way, distractions and derailments that, that God is asking us to keep our eyes forward. There's a fantastic scripture in Isaiah 43 that says this. I'm just going to read it. I won't say much about it, but listen as I say it and and allow it to touch your heart. God speaking to his people says this, fear not for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, not if you pass through the waters, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Your Savior. (sighs) When you go through the waters, when you go through the flames, he will be with you. Nothing will touch you. You will walk through on dry land. The smell of the flames will not even be on you because the Lord, your God, is with you. Keep your eyes on the goal. Keep walking. Keep your eyes on what God has said and keep walking. What has he said to you? He said that I will be your God and I will be your savior. What has he said to you? He, said, he has said to you, make disciples of all nations. What has he said to you? He said that all things work together for your good. What has he said to you? You will be the head and not the tail. What has he said to you? He said great and precious promises that we keep in our minds. That you will be comforted with the comfort that he has comforted. You will comfort others, sorry, with the comfort that he has comforted you. You will be salt and light. The environment will be changed because you are there. These are the things he has said to you. Keep focused. Keep strong. Keep believing. (laughs) 
Guys, there's one last thing I want to say, one last part of the scripture that I want us to look at, which will be quite quick. There was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us to his home and for three days entertained us hospitably. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him and after prayer placed his hands on him and healed him. When this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. You know, guys, this is Paul. I mean, this is Paul. He's in like dire straits, bitten by snakes, shipwrecked. I mean, nearly killed. You know, people won't listen to him. He's trying to steer this thing in the right direction. In the midst of that, a sick person comes to them. He heals them and then he just heals everyone. You know, when we think of God, we often disassociate his attributes from him. We often think about, oh, now the power of God is here. But the truth is that God is not separated from his power. It's not like sometimes God is healing and sometimes he's not. It doesn't, it's not like God has to try to heal. You understand that? He doesn't have to like work himself up. Like, oh my gosh, they're praying so hard, I better do it now. You see, when God enters a room, everything goes to its right place. Everything goes to its created order. So when we carry the power, the presence of God, when we walk into a room and we are aware of the fact that the presence of God is with us, we're not trying to heal. We're not trying to set things right. We're trying to be and follow the presence of God on us and him in us is doing the work. What does this mean? It, It means that because God is with you, his power is with you. Because God is with you, his power is with you. What does that mean? It means there are no impossible situations. It's the very reason we can be salt and light because we, it's not about us. It's not about our smartness. It's not about our innate abilities. It's not about our strength. It's about the fact that we are aware that God is with us. And therefore, anything around us must come into the order that God has decreed it. That means it doesn't matter how many sick people you bring me. God is with me. It doesn't matter how many broken families I'm involved in. God is with me. It doesn't matter how bad the business is. God is with me. It doesn't matter how difficult the assignment is. God is with me. His power is with me because he is with me. I'm not trying to fix this. I'm just trying to follow Jesus. I'm trying to follow Jesus. We said right at the beginning of the sermon series, the book of Acts shows you what happens to the world when you dare to follow Jesus. So Lord Jesus, we pray and we ask that we will be carriers of your presence. Lord God, I ask that your, your power that is already resting on us by virtue of you with us would be evident to the world. Holy Spirit, I pray that we would not back down. I pray, Father God, even in places where there's discouragement in our hearts, Lord God, help us to lift our eyes to what you have said. Father God, help us to walk as if that were already true. Father God, where you've told us to go somewhere, let us go, Lord God. Where you've told us to speak things, tell us, Lord, let us speak them. When you've told us to be a certain kind of person, let us be that kind of person, Lord God. Where you've told us to love like you've loved us, Lord God, let us love like that. Lord God, Lord God, let us not be distracted or disrail, derailed by anything. Holy Spirit, we are aware that those things fall apart, fall aside when we just keep focused on who you are. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. In closing, I want to pray for some people. I want to pray um, for people that, you know what? There have been some distractions and some derailments. 
It's like things have been battering you from left and right, and you know you're supposed to keep your eyes on Jesus, but heck, it's getting quite difficult. I know how that feels, and if that's you, won't you stand? We want to, we want to acknowledge your perseverance and your faith, and we want, to, we want to agree with you that you just keep walking. So if that's you, and there are some things that are just coming against you, some difficulties, please won't you stand? not. I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Father God, I pray for each one of these that you would lift up their eyes, you would help them to see what the enemy is trying to crowd out. Lord God, help them to remember you and your resurrection. Let them see, Lord God, your love for them. Lord God, on a daily basis, let them hear your voice saying, this is the way, walk in it. Lord God, we speak those, to those distractions and we command you to step aside. We speak to those attacks of the enemy and we command you to fall to the ground. We speak to everything that stands between them and your purpose for them and we say step aside right now in Jesus' name. Step aside in Jesus' name. Step aside in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You'll feel a peace settling on your heart. Just receive that. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Those of you who are not standing, you'll feel a peace settle on your heart too. That's Jesus saying for the distractions in the future. Feel this. Feel my assurance that I am with you. I am with you. Where you go, I go. I hear the Lord right now making a promise to us as a church. I will heal this land. I will heal this land. If I saved Sodom and Gomorrah, if I was prepared to save Sodom and Gomorrah for 10 people, how much more will I save this nation because of you? How much more will I save this nation because of you? Do not fear, do not be alarmed. I am faithful. I am faithful. And Lord God, we stand. I'm going to ask everyone to stand. I feel like we need to just pray for our nation right now. Please please pray in whatever language you would like. This is not a a spectator sport. Let us all come before the Lord. So pray in whatever language. Pray in tongues if you can. Lord Jesus, we bring this nation of South Africa before you. Lord God, we note the distractions and the derailments that the enemy has brought to try and thwart your purposes for her. Lord God, but we also note the glory of the risen God, the glory of Christ over this nation. Holy Spirit, we look to the cross and to your resurrection and we declare, Lord God, that that is our portion. That is our future. Lord God, we look to what you have said. We look to who you are, Lord God. Father God, we speak to those distractions and derailments and we say bow now before the living God bow now before the living God corruption poverty anger hatred violence you will you will bow crime you will bow Lord God we look and we see a nation ordered by your steps by your voice ordered by you Lord God ordered by you Lord God we look and see a government strong and righteous. We look and see families strong and whole. We look and see godly men and women 
bringing your life into every sphere. Lord God, we declare it, we believe it, we look to it, and we refuse the distractions, and we say yes to your purposes. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. And lastly, if there's anyone here and you're not sure that your life is right with God, you're not sure that your eternity is held in God's hands, you're not sure what would happen if you were to die, you are not sure about where your life is, I want to give you an opportunity to be sure. So if you are here and you are not certain, would you pray this prayer with me? Lord Jesus, can we all pray it? Lord Jesus, I come to you. I confess my sin and I turn to you. Holy Spirit, would you save me and would you change me? Would you cause me to be born again? I trust you and I look to Jesus as the only one who can save me. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you are here and you prayed that prayer and you meant it as a way of asking God for your future to be assured, I would love you to just raise your hand because I would love to pray for you. Is there anyone here who who did that? Maybe you've done it before, but there you go. Is there anyone else? Is there anyone else? Thank you, Lord. My friend, I'm going to invite you to just come forward because I'd love to pray for you here. And if there's anyone else when I I didn't see your hand, please feel free to come forward. Come on forward. Let's give her a hand as she comes. Thank you, Lord. There's someone else. Let's give him a hand. Come on forward. So great to have you, my friend. Extend your hands, church. Lord Jesus, we, we um, receive these into our family. We say there is space for you. Welcome. Welcome. Holy Spirit, would you bless them? Would you lead them? Would you change them? Fill them again with your presence. Deliver them from all their fears. Speak to them the assurance that they are saved and they are with you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen and amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. God bless you. God's with you. Go receive the kingdom like children. Go and have some fun. Love on people. Tell them who Jesus is, what he's done for you. God bless you.